Okay, uh, good morning everyone. I'm Jeff. Uh, thanks Isaiah and thanks to the committee. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here uh, opening the session today. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, I guess, the base language. So over uh, yesterday and continuing today, uh, you'll hear, you heard and will hear all kinds of exciting things that people are working on. Uh, there are many, many important fundamental bits of work that are going on uh, involving threading, graphics, uh, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of neat language features. So what is left for me is the question. Uh, and I guess I get, I get to handle the, 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 the minutia and the details and the, the abstract nonsense that goes on behind the scenes. Um, and so that, that I'll try to reveal some of that uh, in what we're working on in that area. Uh, and a lot of this stuff uh, that I'm talking about is kind of uh, medium to long-term development. Uh, some of it we're planning, you know, we're, we're pretty sure about and we're planning to put in a release that, you know, an upcoming release, maybe 0.5, maybe 0.6, and some of it is longer-term kind of speculation. Um, so some topics. Uh, I'm going to talk about basically the type system, um, some things about functions. Functions are pretty important, right? That's a pretty big topic. Uh, and some static analysis, uh, and then just some miscellaneous things uh, that bother me. Uh, so all right, so Julia, Julia types. Um, so, so let's see. Uh, so the, so what, what are our types? Uh, so really, uh, the, the most important basic uh, Julia type, uh, you know, when you have a value in a, in a program, it has some type attached to it. And what, what I mean by that is re it's really just sort of a, a symbolic expression. It's just a, uh, it's a, it's a nested, structured uh, thing uh, that just has some information in it, uh, in, a, in a nested kind of structure. And so that, that's really all it is. Uh, it's, a pretty, it, it's, it's a little bit limited. It's not, it's not fully general. There's some rules about what the structure can be, uh, but that's basically what it is. It's a thing that describes uh, the value. Um, but then on top of that, uh, in order to do analysis and to have richer programs uh, and to give more flexibility, we sort of add some forms of essentially uncertainty about what those might be, because you don't always know what you have. You, you, when you have an actual value, you know what it is, uh, but there are all kinds of potentialities. You know, I have an array, what can be in this array? Or I have a function, what can be passed to this function? So to handle these kinds of uh, uncertainties and, and potential states, uh, you need to have some notion of what something not concretely is, but, but might be in some general way. And so we have a system that consists of basically four different kinds of uncertainty that we can model. Um, so one of them is kind of uncertainty in a, a sort of type family or type tree kind of sense, uh, where you have this tree of, of abstract types, sort of an inheritance kind of thing. Uh, and also you can have a, a one of n. You know, I, I know that the thing I have might be one of these four things, but I don't know which one it is. And so that's sort of the type union. Uh, or you might just have uncertainty about one part of one of these. So I could have some say, array type, and I know most, of, most about it, but there's one little part where I don't know what it is, so there's sort of a, a hole in there. Uh, so that's, that's a third form of uncertainty. And then also you can have, uh, you can talk about things that might be any length. Uh, so this is basically the var args methods where you have a, a dot, 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 and you, you don't know how many actual arguments you might get. Uh, so a little bit, slightly more formally, uh, it looks like this. So there's a, at the top, there's the, the any type, which means everything. And then there's a bottom type, which means no values, so the empty set of values. Uh, and then we have abstract types and these sort of what you might call tag types, which are the, the types that can actually be labeling a value. Uh, which, and those are the types that we all declare all the time when we're, we're programming. Um, and then, of course, you have tuples. So in these slides, I'm writing the tuple types with just the curly braces without tuple in front of it, because I kind of like that notation. It's more compact. Uh, I kind of advocate for that. Uh, and then at the bottom, we have, in, we have in red the really difficult ones. These are the, this is where all the, all the crazy action happens. Uh, so I have there the, the var arg tuple, where it, you might have any repetitions of, uh, of b at the end. So this is, this is kind of like a regular expression, right? It does, uh, it's sort of like a star uh, in, in a regex, where you can match any number of something at the end. Uh, and then you have, of course, the, the union type. Um, and at the bottom, you basically have this construct that introduces a variable and the variable ranges over some range of types, and then that, uh, the s type at the end can have that variable in it somewhere, and you basically take a union of that for all possible values of that variable. So that sort of pro that provides a way to you know, build up you know, every, every version of this type where this part of it has certain values in it. 
Uh, so this is, this is sort of the system. And we developed this gradually over time uh, in kind of an informal way at first. We built it up, you know, add, we, oh, this looks like it's useful, we'll add that. We just went by what seemed useful and what we thought we could implement. Uh, but then, you know, ab about, uh, about six months ago, it became quite clear that it was time to step back and take stock and figure out what was really going on and how, how this should really work uh, and see if we could formalize it a little bit uh, and make it work really, really well. Um, so that's one thing we've been working on. Uh, over the past few months. And this, this work has not made it into the system yet, but I, I have high hopes that it will very, very soon. Um, so actually, uh, Jake and Jahao, who are in here somewhere, worked with me on this, uh, and the three of us together uh, eventually got somewhere uh, with this. So, so basically, uh, the, the theory uh, behind how a system like this works uh, is this is a subtyping system, uh, which means that when you build together uh, different types of the form uh, that I showed here, they have, these, they have these relations. Some of them include others. Uh, you know, ab, uh, integer includes int, number includes integer, uh, but then in much more elaborate ways for the, for the other forms of types. Uh, and determining these inclusions is, is very important. So this is a little, bit of, a little bit of the notation for this. As we talk about, uh, if we have some type t, there is some notion of a, a set of values, you know, like the set of all integers uh, that it refers to, which is sometimes written with this double brackets t. Uh, so then we can, we can go through and write equations for all of the other types. So as a, an easy example, um, it's like the union type. A union type means, you know, take the set of these two types and union the sets together. So this one is really easy to write, really hard to implement, <laughs> is the summary of that. And so when, when we have, uh, in Julio, we have the, the less than colon operator, which will test a subtype relationship. And that basically means, are, you know, is, is one set a subset of the other? Um, so why is that so important? We use this everywhere. This is kind of the fundamental thing uh, that drives how the language works and you know, determines sort of what happens at almost every point in the program. Uh, so determining whether arguments match a method. So you have the type of the arguments, you have the type of a candidate method, and if one is a subtype of the other, then the method can be called, otherwise it can't be. Right? So that's, that's pretty important. And then also comparing method signatures. So if you add a new definition, we have to test if it's equal to an existing one, so then we overwrite that method. Um, you wouldn't want to have lots of methods that are basically, you know, that, that are identical in their signatures, but they're all in there, so you don't know which one's going to be called. Uh, and then we also need to compare signatures for specificity, so this is part of that, uh, because, you know, if one, if one thing is a subset of another, it's sort of more specific, and that's, there's actually more to specificity, but that's sort of the core of it, right, so that's very important. Uh, and then, of course, any time you actually put some kind of a type assertion uh, or assign a value to something that's supposed to have a particular type, we need to check that. We might check it at runtime, we might check it at compile time, but you need the same exact uh, subtype operation for that. Uh, and then also within the compiler, you need to have, uh, you need to be able to check this to know basically that certain algorithms have converged. Uh, that, you know, once the set stops changing, we've reached some kind of fixed point. So you need it again there. So this is the, sort of the, the key crucial algorithm. And once you have uh, once you have an algorithm for doing this, you can pretty much do everything else you need to do uh, with the type system. So we sat down and tried to come up with a, make sure we had a really solid algorithm. Um, it turns out this is difficult. Uh, so there are many similar systems to this that are actually undecidable. Uh, there have been many very simple subtyping systems that people have come up with and initially thought were perfectly fine and decidable, and then years later people proved that they weren't decidable. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting area that sort of flirts with the, the boundary of, of what is even computable, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, so we're, we're, I'm, I'm actually not positive that our system is decidable. I kind of think it is. I have some reasons to think it is, uh, but we haven't proven it. Um, and when, when, when decidable, a lot of systems like this are still very, very complex. So you know, we're talking about uh, set inclusion uh, and set operations like union. And in, in full generality, uh, when you have equations describing sets, they're solving them can actually be x time complete or n x time complete, which is, you know, if you've if you heard of NP complete problems, you know, that's nothing compared to this, <laughs> right? This is, NP complete is easy, you know, <laughs> compared to this. This is, the, these are ridiculously complex problems. In fact, e even if P equals NP, these problems are still probably hard. That is, that, that is how bad these are. It's, re it's really, really complex, you know, so your compiler is working very hard for you. You know, I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, but we think we have a, a correct algorithm for this now. Uh, so here's some examples of what it can do. Some of these uh, should be kind of familiar if you're used to some of the fancier Julia method signatures. Um, 
So at the top there we have, a, so we, you, you can imagine we have sort of some argument types on the left uh, and a, a method signature on the right. And so that signature says, you know, for, for some integer type and some other type that's a subtype of that, I have a, a vector of the first type and a, a value of the second type. And does this thing on the left match that? Right? And then there are a few other things like this. Um, so an interesting one is when variables occur multiple times, you can see it's a little bit more complex, right? It has to, you know, in general, you can imagine if, there, if there's only one variable that repeats, that's sort of more constrained than something that has more variables and more degrees of freedom. And that's a, it turns out it doesn't actually work that way, but that's kind of the intuition of the kind of things this algorithm has to work out. Um, another good one uh, is a relationship between tuples and unions. So they actually uh, will distribute, right? So you can, you can rewrite uh, that tuple with a union inside it on the left, you can rewrite it to the right form where it's a union of two possible tuples. Right? So those types are actually equal in, in some sense. Right? You can imagine any, any value that belongs to one has to belong to the other, and, you know, and vice versa. So those are really equal. Um, and then at the bottom I have something kind of fancy uh, where you have basically a, a series of arguments uh, that are either a, a vector of s or a vector of vectors of s, and then you can have any number of them. And you know, given some candidate uh, arguments, does that match? Um, so we have an algorithm that can do this. Um, and I can demo that a little bit. So we have an implementation of this uh, in Julia, of course. Uh, and you can actually find this code in the examples directory. Uh, it's a file called juliatypes.jl. Uh, So I'll just, just, to, just to glance at it very quickly. So I have, a, so I have my own uh, abstract uh, type of all the, the types that I'll model, and I have types for all of them and show methods for them. So this, this models the whole system I was just talking about. Um, I'm not going to go through it in detail. Uh, but essentially, then you get to this algorithm, and the, the algorithm has to have some state. It does basically a kind of, has to do a kind of backtracking. Um, and so there, there's, there's this whole algorithm. And I think this actually works, believe it or not. Uh, so let's, let's take a look. Uh, let's see. So let's just see if I can do a quick demo. Okay, so here's, here's an example from the last slide. So I can have, a, I can have this tuple of unions or the, or the union of tuples. And if we try this in the current Julia, it actually says false. So right, much to my embarrassment, this, the algorithm we have currently in the system doesn't do this right. Um, but there's hope because I have an implementation. I'll just call is sub instead of the built-in operator. And lo and behold, it's true. <laughs> so this, so this, this is progress. I get to show the word true. <laughs> So there, there is some hope that this thing works better. But what does this mean for you? What will you be able to do when this lands? So here, here's, some, here's some features that we think we'll get out of this. Uh, so a little bit more flexible dispatch. So you can do, uh, you might have heard of the so-called diagonal dispatch, where if you have a uh, sort of a method parameter t, and then t occurs twice, well, the two t's always have to be the same. So you get kind of a, a diagonal of a, of a dispatch matrix. Uh, but you could also do sort of a triangular shape in the, in the dispatch space where you have a, I could have, well, T is going to be some real type, and then A has to be some array that has that as an element type. Uh, so this gives you some nice flexibility. I know, especially in, in linear algebra, I think people are, want, really want this and find this very useful. Um, you can actually not be so afraid of union types. You can use them a lot more because they'll work better. Um, and in fact, method signatures right now, or you can basically always think of them as tuple types. They're basically a, a tuple of the types of the arguments, but they could really be almost any type, um, and any type that is, uh, that is some kind of tuple type. Uh, so they could be a union type, for instance, right? This is a, a union of two tuples is definitely also a tuple, so that should work, right? So you could write 
Uh, I don't know what the syntax would be for this, uh, so suggestions welcome. Uh, but you could imagine a method whose type was any int union with int any. And that would mean that one or the other, but not necessarily both, arguments is an int. Um, which is especially handy because I think it avoids lots of redundant definitions. I, I don't know if this has happened to you, uh, but I find sometimes if I want something like that, and you have to write three definitions basically to, to make that work without ambiguity warnings. Uh, so this would, that would fix that, uh, which would be very nice. Um, and also I hope that when we, when we put in this algorithm, uh, it'll probably close, I'm guessing, on the order of five to ten bugs right off the bat. Um, and we, we probably get much more accurate uh, method ambiguity information. Uh, which we could hopefully use to remove the, the annoying ambiguity warnings uh, that you sometimes see scrolling on your screen, uh, and we could do something smarter internally because we'll have much more accurate uh, information about that. All right, moving on, next topic. Um, so higher order programming in Julia. Uh, so higher order programming uh, refers in general to basically using functions like normal values, passing functions to functions, returning functions from functions, um, which is something you can do in Julia right now. You can pass functions as arguments uh, and so on, but it's not really our main focus. You can, if you look at our libraries and everything, you can tell it's not sort of primarily designed around that. Um, and because we tend to use method definition instead, right, which is kind of a similar form. Right? You can, if you make a new type and you define some method of it, you know, other code can call that. Uh, by calling your method. So it sort of achieves something similar to passing a function, uh, but it doesn't quite feel the same. Uh, and it's not really exactly the same, but it, it, it's close enough that we, we mostly get away with that. Um, so there, there are lots of questions about how we can improve the state of, uh, of higher order programming. Um, so there, there are a few problems. Uh, so performance is an issue. Uh, doing, doing lots of functional programming kinds of constructs like maps and folds is generally in Julia much slower than using, you know, uh, idiomatic uh, array programming kinds of things, like just summing some, just calling the sum function. Um, so performance is an issue. Uh, and also, if you find uh, some function like sign and you type type of sign in your terminal, the answer is just function, um, which is not a very impressive answer, in my opinion. Uh, it doesn't tell you a whole lot. Uh, so surely we can do better than that. Um, and, and also internally, if you're familiar with the internals at all, it's, I, I think it's a little bit too complicated uh, right now, because we effectively have sort of two implementations uh, of this, because there's the method system uh, that gives you a way of doing a kind of higher order programming, and then there's also the sort of, you, you know, you can have a function object and pass that, and internally these, this comes out as kind of two implementations. There's, there are multiple types involved here. There's function, this lambda static data thing, method table and method, and arguably maybe a couple others. Uh, so surely we can get rid of at least one of those and, and get, have, you know, have it be a little simpler internally. Um, so one issue here is uh, the idea of a, a closure. So this is a term that means basically a function with some data wrapped inside. So I could write a, a function like this that returns a, an adding function. Right? I, you give me an x and I'll give you back a function that takes something else and adds x to it. So in this case, this function I return has the x kind of in, stored inside of it like data. So you, that's very similar to an object already. Right? There's, it has a, you have something with some, some data wrapped inside it. But it's not 100% clear how this kind of thing relates to generic functions and methods. Uh, it clearly is related, and there, there are many ways you can imagine slicing it and designing it, but there, there's a bit of a design space you know, to explore. Uh, so we need to figure out exactly what we want to do and have a very, very good answer for how this relates to uh, the rest of the function system. Uh, so here's, here's some example designs. So I have, I have basically two. Um, so one possibility here, we start with the, we start with the code on the left, uh, which is a function that has other method definitions inside of it. So we have a local function g that has two definitions. Uh, there they are. And so one way we could translate that in the future, um, as I go over to the right, and I would you'd basically generate this code uh, where we'd have some kind of a, a closure type, which could, so that, that definition could actually be in the li standard library. You wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't need to write that every time. Um, and then we have a definition of call. So this is a new feature in point four, where you can, uh, if you overload a method called call, then you can t call your object with parentheses, just as if it were a function, uh, which is very handy for this, because you can just define, how do I call this closure? Uh, well, I take the, the whatever function is inside of it, um, and I, just, I call that with the closure itself and passing along whatever arguments were, were there. 
So how, how the function inside is called, I don't know, I don't, I don't care. But that, you know, this, so this, we just, you know, I pass that down the, the recursive chain and, you know, it'll, everything will work out, right? Uh, so now I have to actually put the behavior of the, the G function somewhere. Uh, so that's why I renamed it to underscore G because underscore means magic and secret and terrifying. <laughs> uh, so, so this will be the actual implementation and you can see I took the, the signatures from the left and I just inserted a, a closure argument as the first argument and so to call one of these uh, you would do the exact same uh, bodies of those functions except the accesses to the the closed over variables, as they're called, are, are replaced with accesses to this data structure, you know, the, the object interpretation uh, of the closure. And then finally, the actual function f itself will be, would be translated to that at the bottom, where it basically all it does is create a data structure. It, it allocates an object that says, you know, call g and here's the data for it, here's the x. Uh, so this, this translation would work. But there's another possible way to do it as well. Uh, so here I, I can add a little more complexity. Uh, so we have a very similar situation, uh, except here I also have the, the, types, uh, the types inside the definition of the inner function depends on something from the environment, right? So I, before I kind of glossed over that, right? I, you can see I had, I had int and any, and I just sort of moved them over to the, the top level without saying how I did that. And I just sort of assumed that, you know, those identifiers would work out. They'd be, they'd be available there. Um, so I kind of pulled a fast one, but you know, so what if in general it depended on something from the environment? So there's a question, should we even allow that? Is that even a good idea? Um, maybe, you know, all, uh, maybe the types on all these method signatures should always be evaluatable at the top level or something, so we know much more about what the program's going to do in advance. That might be worthwhile, I, I'm not sure. Um, but we could, we could handle this too with this different translation, so basically this basically rewrites this, you know, to what you would do now if you made your own new callable type. So I would, I would create my own, my own new type just for this situation, which will be the, the F closure, but this time it has this parameter. So there's an X inside of it uh, that has, we know, you know, we know what type it's going to be. Uh, and then the call definition for that is basically the same as on the last slide. Uh, but the interesting thing is uh, I can use diagonal dispatch here. So we know that the, the argument that it accepts is the same as that type parameter. Right, so I was able to capture the fact that this method is only defined on T, right? which I think, that, I think that's pretty neat. So you can actually sort of put in the object, you know, when I'm going to call this in the future, what does the other argument have to be? Uh, so this is another alternate, you know, alternate variation on that that we could pick. Uh, so we have, to, you know, we have to decide what to do. And there's some, there's some issues open on all of these things. If you, if you read GitHub really, really, really thoroughly, you know, you can, you can find out about all of this. Uh, it's all there somewhere, uh, but you know, sometimes I can't find it myself when I search for it, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, but it, it's, it's all kind of there. And I think everything I'm talking about in this talk is, is there somewhere, but I, I don't expect people to read GitHub that thoroughly. So, you know, hence this talk. Uh, all right, next higher order programming topic. Uh, so the infamous map function, which has been the, the topic of some debate. So. So this is basically the operation of applying a function to every element of some collection, like a list or an array. Very common, important, simple operation. Uh, and in the functional programming world, in general, it's, it's talked about this way. It basically has this type, and I'm making up notation here. This is sort of pseudo Julia syntax, not real syntax. Uh, but the idea is that you have some function that takes A to B, and you have a list of A, and you'll end up with a list of B. Right? It's very, very intuitive, very nice little package. Um, but you won't find this written anywhere in, in anyone's Julia code. Uh, so why not? And what's, what's the problem? So the problem is that, <laughs> that, that is where the problem comes in, uh, which is that we don't have a sort of canonical notion of what type something returns. You know, give me, give me the plus function. What, does, what type does it return? You know, I, it's, re it's really difficult to say. It could be many, many things. You know, so in our case, it's not so easy to just say what the return type is. Uh, and in fact, we use dynamic typing, so it's you know, arguably almost hopeless to, to say for in every case you know, what is the actual return type for this function and get something useful out of that. Uh, so that's, some, that's kind of the trade-off we've accepted, right? So all the, all the great stuff you can do in Julia is not free, right? There, there's a trade-off somewhere, uh, and this is definitely one of them. Uh, but, you know, don't panic. Uh, 
So this is, this is very nice, but you know, f the, the dirty secret is you do not actually need this type to map a function over something, right? This is like, uh, you know, you don't, you don't need to understand quantum mechanics to turn on a light switch. You know, it's sort of like that. Like you, you're allowed to call a function on some stuff even if you, you know, don't have this type. So I think there's, there, there's hope. Uh, so what can we do? Well, if we're not going to have those kind of arrow types, as they're called, um, we can use what's called nominal function types, uh, which basically means, you know, just use the types we have that we use for objects and just use them for functions also. Just keep using the same thing. Um, so it's a bit second class. You know, people will tell you it's not real function types, and yeah, it's not. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a second class thing. Java uses them. When Java added lambdas to the language, they basically did the same approach. So there's, you know, there's some prior art there. Um, but yes, you know, Java, doing the same thing as Java, right, is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely safe, but, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like something you can brag about. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there is actually, there is actually an upside, and I think, uh, I think also in our area of scientific computing, I think there's, there can be a significant upside, uh, which is that you can basically classify functions how you want. So the, the arrow types are really powerful, but they, you know, they sort of insist that a function is always described as what is its argument and what is its return value. But that's not always what's interesting about a function, right? The way you think about the program. So I have, I have an example here from Steve Johnson, actually, that he gave me, where he's, he's, doing, uh, he's doing some numeric integration uh, for a physics problem, and what he really cares about is the order of singularity that occurs in some function, right? So that's sort of how you want to model the problem, because it's the thing that really, really matters. So you can define a type, so he made this power law type that has a P inside that will tell you basically the, the power uh, on something. So then you can, you can describe the type in a, way that, you know, in a way that maps well to your problem, and you can see you can do dispatch on this, and then you know, I can specify an implementation for a particular value of P. And of course, if I, you know, the idea is that you'd have a, you know, a special, more efficient or more accurate version for certain values of P, and you could specialize for that. So that's actually kind of handy. Um, it's actually pretty nice to just to classify functions, you know, in a way that, that you want to. So it's not so bad. Uh, and you can even do tricks like this. So you could, if you want something that's kind of like an arrow type, uh, you can have what I might call a nominal arrow type. So you just, you, you call it arrow, but it's just a, a Julia type like any other. Uh, so this is sort of an illusion. Uh, and then you just define a call method for it. And you see the arrow has the argument and return type. So if I defined this, so this basically forces the argument to be of the requested type, and then when it calls the function inside it, uh, however that happens, and then it uh, does a type assertion to make sure it always returns something of type R. So you'd have something here that pretty much behaves how you want, uh, and then you could in fact write uh, a map function that accepted one of these arrow types as the first argument, and you could put your A and B in there, and you could, you could write the whole thing, and then you'd, then you'd get what you want. Um, the downside is that not every function will be of this type. right? I, you know, if you, I just write this type now, some function someone else writes is not of this type, right? That, that's, the, that's the downside. So that's the, the second classness uh, of this. But at least it gives you something you can do. So if, if you wanted to program this way, you'd have to arrange to somehow go around wrapping things in, in arrow types as you wanted. Um, so you, you can do it. Not, not ultra convenient, but at least it's possible somehow. Uh, and this is, a, this is a good way to do this in a language like ours. Uh, this is another kind of cute, sketchy example. Uh, this one, I'm not sure this actually runs as written. This is kind of a sketch. Uh, but the idea is that you could have a, an object that represents some native function that just has a pointer inside of it with the address, and you could define that to basically do a C call. So you'd have an object you could pass around, and it just uh, sort of, you know, when, when you call it, it just automatically does the right C call. So you, this could maybe be a helpful tool for wrapping libraries. All right, so generic functions in general, right? Th these are a little tricky, right? So what is, what is the type of something like plus, right? Even not committing to any definition of type, just for, you know, any definition you like, uh, you know, and, and the hint is that it has a, I, in whatever Julia I was using at the time when I, when I wrote this, it has 138 methods, right? So if ideally you want some kind of a, a pithy answer to what is the type of this, and if you have to talk about 138 methods, that doesn't seem so great, right? So I, I think, a good answer is, well, it's a function that behaves like plus. <laughs> this, this thing, basically, it, 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 is, it is as it does, right? I, I can't really tell you much more. It's just, it's this function. If you want to know what it does, call it and see what happens. 
Hopefully nothing dangerous. <laughs> uh, so this already happens a little bit because ever since we added the call overloading feature, uh, people have been exploiting this uh, to, do, to, you know, to do all kinds of uh, metaprogramming and uh, put more abstractions on top of things. So like there's a, you can find, people have defined things like add fun, which is a sort of nominal function for plus uh, that you can dispatch on and so on. But when you call it, it just does a plus. Um, and so there you have a function that just means plus. So this is already done somewhat. Uh, and I could imagine extending this to basically everything, right? Instead of defining a new type like add fun and sub fun and mul fun for every function, why not just have it do that already by default, right? So the type of plus would just be already, it would just say, well, it's a generic function and it's the plus function. So basically a different type for every function uh, that just tells you which one you have. Uh, and that seems a little bit crazy at first, uh, but if we're going to go through and write add fun, sub fun, mul fun for everything, if, we're, if that's the alternative, we might as well do it this way, right? So this could be a, a good answer to that question. All right, next topic. Uh, future static analysis, compiler analyses. Uh, so Julia is actually based on static analysis. Uh, it's really designed around static analysis. Uh, and we, you know, we, it's easy to talk about it as being, oh, it's a fast dynamic language. So people think of you know, all kinds of fancy optimizations you must have to do uh, to get performance. We don't really do really fancy optimizations in this sense. Like, uh, so there, there are all kinds of really, really amazing, uh, dazzling optimizations you can do. Like our, and they're done in JavaScript engines, for example, uh, that can give you huge speed ups for you know, even fairly hopeless language designs. Um, <laughs> But we actually don't really do that. We, if, you, if you know about JIT compilers and you look at our compiler, it really will not impress you. Right? We, we don't do all those fancy optimizations. We really prefer to rely on static analysis. Um, because ultimately, I think, ultimately static analysis is what you're going to want. If you want the absolute highest performance, you know, not just a, a factor of two or a factor of three, but you know, as fast as C or faster, then you are going to need some kinds of program analyses. It's just unavoidable. Uh, and if you want to do static compilation, uh, separate compilation, you're going to have to have some kind of static analysis. It's, you know, some people want to run code and they don't want to JIT compiling things while their code is running. Maybe they're running on a machine where you don't want to have both writable and executable pages, right? So you, you need to be able to do something to address these things, I think. And so we've, we do static analysis right now uh, for type inference, uh, but we've really only scratched the surface uh, of what kinds of analysis you can do. And this happened recently. <laughs> So, <laughs> so many, many, many of you may recognize Oscar from GitHub. Uh, he is the hero of the new garbage collector that's going to be in 0 0.4 and is much, much faster. Where's, oh, he's over there. There. <laughs> so, so the really amazing thing is that GC is only a side interest for Oscar. <laughs> It is only a minor side interest. It turns out what, he, what he's really interested in is static analysis and program analysis, and that this is what he really wanted to work on, which I think is really amazing. And so he is actually pretty far along in writing a new framework uh, for doing program analyses of just the kind that we need. Uh, so he's writing this. Uh, last night, I was the first person to start on GitHub, so I'm proud of that. <laughs> Not highly publicized yet, very, very late breaking stuff. Uh, but basically, this can do much more general and thorough kinds of analysis than what we're doing now. So it, it, it implements uh, one of the basic uh, bits of technology in there is, is something called product domains, which means that uh, you can talk about what something is in many different senses. You can say, you know I, know, I know this about it, and I know this about it, and I know that about it, and I know that about it. And you can just chain arbitrary things together. Um, so you can do, use that to do uh, more constant propagation, more aggressive uh, evaluation of constant things. Um, analysis about memory and object lifetimes, aliasing analysis, uh, and his code handles higher order functions very well. Uh, it handles anonymous functions, uh, and it, al it also handles object fields uh, much better than our current compiler does. And, but <laughs> close, right? <laughs> and probably maybe, maybe some other things that I, I don't know about, but it's this, this is the kind of, uh, kind of stuff he's aiming for. Uh, so let's see. So I, have a, I actually have kind of a demo of this. Uh, So I didn't, even, I didn't even ask him to do this, but he just started making this. this is, so he made a, a, a visualization in Escher, of course. Thanks, Shashi. Uh, 
of how his analysis works. Uh, so this, this is pretty cool. He shows, uh, so on, on the left there, uh, you have basically a, a really bro finely broken down uh, representation of a program that just shows everything it does in, you know, in, in minute detail, sometimes just you know, a single variable at a time, right? Re really putting it under the microscope. Uh, and then over there, on the, in the right column, it has basically everything it knows about it. Uh, so you can see, uh, so right here we have, uh, when we just have the number one, well, what do we know about one? We know that it's, uh, okay, it, it's a constant with the value one, and it's an int 64, and it's positive. Right? And then I, I, we go through analyzing the program, and these things, uh, and these things build up. So you'll see, so if sometimes uh, you'll see a def appears here, where we say, okay, that was the definition of a variable. That's where it was introduced. Um, and we'll see as, the, as we go through the program, this information changes. And so here there's a, this point means basically that two, uh, two parts of the program merged, so that we have a value for x at this point, which came from two other program points, so it keeps track of that, right? And uh, so this can actually do an animation. Uh, let me just try it. So I, if I click running, yes, so we'll see it, we'll see it actually stepping through and updating this live. I went, it went by really fast. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> let me see. Let me try starting it again. Okay, so you can you can see it just ru running through very fast, updating this. It's a cool it's a cool visualization. <laughs> so that's pretty neat. He just did this in the last couple days, you know, just just for the hell of it. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Thank you, Oscar. All right, grab bag topics. Miscellaneous things that annoy me. So this is one of my very favorite uh, issues, number 8450, uh, which is about the, this so-called vectorized syntax, which is basically where you write sine of x, uh, and x is a vector, and it maps the sine function over everything. It just applies it to every element. So I think this has a lot of problems, actually, although this is, this is very popular very compact notation, very convenient. All that is undeniable, uh, but, it's, but it's really kind of worrying because I, I think this is really not the right abstraction uh, because you know, a function and iterating it are really just separate things, right? They're, they're, they're clearly orthogonal, right? So it, it feels like it should be represented that way. Uh, and also the way we do this right now is you basically add another method definition for this function of a vector. And it seems like you, know, you shouldn't have to add a definition for every time you write a function. You know? and so there's something a little wrong about that. Uh, and this also can have performance problems uh, in the absence of really smart compiler optimizations because you can end up looping over things multiple times. Uh, and then lastly, and maybe least importantly, right, it's kind of mathematically specious. Right? It's, it's not really true that the sign of a vector is the sign of all the elements of it, which is, you know, if, if this were okay in every other way, maybe we could live with that. But it's, you know, it's, another, it's yet another uh, straw on, on the camel's back. Uh, but, but yes, so, so convenient. So I, I don't really know what to do about this. There's a, there's a long discussion there. Um, and I think the, the question is, can we get something better that is you know, close to that level of convenience? Uh, and it's, it's pretty hard to know what to do. So there have been a few proposals. So one is to write something like sine of x over x, uh, which to, to, to write that, of course, you know, it's, it's longer. Uh, it's not exactly clear what it exactly means. It's a, so this is, this is tricky, and so, but I'd like to try to find some kind of a syntax or an approach that's, that's as convenient. Um, something that might help a little bit uh, is to basically use this nominal function types trick, and where I could just define that you know, any function of a certain type called on an array should map itself over it automatically. And like, that would at least have the benefit uh, that you would have sort of just, you'd have this only defined in one place, and you wouldn't have to do it repetitively. Uh, but the need to have, you know, the need for all your functions to sort of be organized into some kind of a, a hierarchy of, uh, of, of what they're like is, you know, is a little bit unsatisfying. Uh, you know, can we really expect any function that's mappable is going to be able to be a subtype of this mappable type? You know, I don't know. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a hard design problem, and feel free to jump in on uh, issue 8450. But I would like to do something about that. Uh, so in-place operations uh, are, are pretty popular among people who like super high performance. Uh, we just have a, a convention right now where you put, you know, if, if you have a function with an exclamation point, then it's an in-place function. It overwrites input. Um, can we do any better than just a, a spelling convention? 
Uh, so an idea I've had kicking around for a while is to do some, again, some kind of a syntax trick. Like we, we, have a, we have a colon equals operator that's unused. Maybe we could use it. Um, so we, I, you know, for example, you could say, you know, if a colon equals something, then that means calling the function, telling it where to put the result. So a convention like that could maybe work. I think we have to think through it a lot uh, to see if that really works right and what the semantics of it really are. Uh, but I, you know, it seems like it'd be nice to, to do something about that. Um, and also, there's, I think, a lot, lot more stuff we can do with, uh, internally with the GC and memory management. This slide is probably here just because I've been you know, talking to Oscar too much the last few days. Uh, so this is just on my, you know, on my mind. Um, yeah, there are, there are many, many things we can do to uh, improve the way our GC works. Uh, you know, there's some questions like, should we, you know, should we leave room in the future to have a collector that can move and compact objects? Uh, right now, we don't do that. Uh, you know, the, it has advantages, like especially if you're interoperating with C, you know, it's nice if things, if, you know, if something isn't trying to move an object when you're trying to use it from C. Uh, th there are solutions to that, but it's, you know, it, it creates a little bit of extra friction uh, for, for native interop. So it's not clear that we want to do that, although it can have, you know, significant performance advantages. Uh, so that's a, that's a question. Uh, I'm kind of inclined to think that we can get by without ever moving objects. Uh, Oscar is not so sure. Um, there are some approaches we could use to amortize overhead of storing tags. Uh, we have to do something about finalizers. Finalizers are, are, are kind of slow and uh, they're not very satisfying. Um, in particular, when you have a, 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 the better the garbage collector performs, it tends to get lazier. It does less and less work freeing objects that it doesn't need to try to free. But if those objects have finalizers, then you know, your finalizer is not going to get called. Uh, so there's, there's a definite mismatch between you know, really good garbage collectors and this finalization thing. Um, and then lastly, something that kind of annoys me is in the, uh, our big num and big float implementation works fine, but it's really pretty slow. Uh, and the, I think, you know, one of the main reasons is the way the memory management works. Um, there's just some, some tricky problems there. Uh, and how, how we have to, you know, for every big int object, we have to arrange for the GMP library to know, to know how, it, how it works. And it, the GMP provides hooks uh, for doing memory management, but it's, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's hard to hook into it in a way that would be the most efficient uh, and have our GC manage the objects more effectively. So it's, that's a bit of a tricky problem. Um, and all right, that's, that's it for my, my grab bag of topics. And that's, uh, that's it. And I'll take questions. Uh, so all the, uh, the, the just curly braces for tuple types. Uh, so as of point 0.4, the old meaning of curly braces is deprecated, so that's available now. I think that's a, this is a good use for it, uh, but uh, it's, you know, it's a topic of debate. Not everyone agrees with me, so I haven't just forced that on everyone yet. <laughs> yeah. question regarding your example about the function you pass as an input to another function. Mm -hmm. Ah, so the, the question is, when you pass function arguments, uh, is the transformation I showed more performant? Um, so that's OK. So, so in, in, the, in the system today, if you manually write that transformation and use that instead, it actually will be more performant. Uh, so that is, that's one reason to do it. But, I mean, that's, of course, due to implementation details. Uh, but the detail is that you know, you, when, you have a, when you have a good mechanism, like our, our generic function mechanism is quite good, once that's, once that's highly developed, you want to just reuse it as much as possible. And so we're not doing that as much as we should. And by, by rewriting it to the thing on the right, you're, you're reusing the good part. So that's, that's sort of why that happens. Uh, so yeah, if you do that manually today, it will be faster. Yeah? So I'm wondering, is the static analysis framework going to cause a bifurcation between the cost of doing things in the REPL and the cost of, say, a whole program compilation? Are we going to wind up where, like, whole programs that get compiled get static analysis with whole programs? Yeah, yeah, very good question. So the, the, quest, the question is, if we do really thorough static analysis, is there going to be a divide between you know, programs that run fast but take a long time to compile versus doing stuff at the REPL? Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will not be a major trade-off. Uh, so Oscar has an approach to implementing this that's pretty efficient. Uh, so I don't think it'll be that big a problem. Uh, and I think there's also other low-hanging performance fruit that we can use to trade off against it. 
Uh, we're hoping to get a more compact, efficient representation of all our uh, ASTs. Uh, and, and if we did that, I think it would, it would trade off the performance and you'd be able to have the, the fast thing all the time. I'm hoping. All right. Um, so for higher order programming, one thing you didn't talk about was uh, specializing in function arguments. Hmm. So what do you mean? Ah, so the question is about specializing on function arguments. Uh, so if you did, I mean, I, I think if you did any of the transformations I talked about, I think we would get that. Uh, because if we, you know, with the, the nominal typing, we specialize on those types uh, the same way we do any other type. Uh, or with the identity typed generic functions, you'd naturally get specialization on particular functions. So you pass plus to something, you'd get a version optimized for just plus, um, which, is, which is great when you want that speed, but you know, the only question is, is that going to generate you know, too much code uh, and you know, tax the compiler excessively? Yeah? Um, the first page said something about traits. Uh, how does this all play in with holy traits? Ah, yeah, so I think, uh, so, so Moro is giving a talk later today, I think, about, uh, about his traits package, which I think is really interesting. Uh, this is sort of a uh, alternate approach uh, to types that you can, you know, with some awkwardness, you can implement in our system today, and there, there, I think there, you know, there's a real question about whether it should be more of a first-class part of the language, uh, as this, you know, it's, this, this is basically a, a system that lets you do kind of a multiple inheritance, where you can kind of attach properties to, to things after the fact, uh, and then dispatch on them. Uh, which is really, really useful. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's definitely a very promising to add something like that to the base language. I'd love to see In the back. Uh, um, the, some of the higher order programming stuff you're talking about, is that related to performance of anonymous functions, or is that a separate independent issue? Yeah, it's, the, it's basically the same issue as performance of anonymous functions. Yeah, it's that issue. Mm -hmm. Ah, so the question is about specializing on values. So yes, uh, I think there, yeah, there, are, there are various ways uh, that could be possible. Uh, it definitely would be good in many cases. Uh, I mean, the, the problem is you know, that clearly you don't want to specialize on every value. <laughs> uh, so yeah. figuring out exactly what the, you know, what the programming interface should be uh, or how to, how to deal with that uh, is, is, you know, is, is an open question. But yeah, it would definitely be useful to, to specialize on values. Yeah. Uh, so can any type be a type parameter? I think al already any type can be a type parameter. Okay. Oh, you mean any, any value, any kind of value? Yeah, yeah, any oh, value. well, any kind of, uh, I think, no. I will, we'll for, for now, I'm planning to keep the current restrictions of what's allowed to be a type parameter. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's not part of it. Yeah. Ah, ah. In cases where maybe that would, you know, incur a huge cost in, in compilation, you just say, I need the type parameter for certain things, but don't actually specialize that. Yeah, so the, the question is annotations for, you know, hinting us to not specialize on things. So we have, a, we have kind of a secret feature for doing that for argument slots. It's quite ugly. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of stuff like that, and it's, it's going to add some, there's going to be some kind of nasty syntax that, you know, most people aren't going to recognize. Uh, so I'd rather not clutter up with, with you know, hints like that. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I have hopes we can do more analysis. We're, we're not doing nearly enough to, to try to figure out what we should specialize on. So I would, I would try to do more in that direction instead. Um, yeah. We should probably move on. I don't see Jake, but we can oh. thank Jeff. Thank you.